how does music education, specifically the way we teach music, contribute to this? I mean, you mentioned not paying attention to what our body's doing, but there's also music either is done right or it's not. So in, in your opinion, what can we do better in music education to stop this? Well, there's music education in the schools and there's music education in the studio. And music education in the schools is highly unequal because the richer school districts have more resources and often better teachers. What I see most coming out of public schools is that the focus is on getting the instrument, getting sound out of the instrument so fast. You've got to have that Christmas concert, that holiday concert, so everybody has to learn how to play. Posture be damned, breathing be damned, we just got to get the music out there so the parents can see their kids play. That's a, that's a biased point of view, but that's what I see all the time. When we're looking at studio teaching, and that goes into college teaching, um, we have a whole tradition of just doing what the teacher says. And the teacher is the god. Um, this is very wounding, I think, to young players who start at age 10 or 12 and are told you have to do what your teacher says. Nobody asks them what they feel or think, and so they learn to devalue themselves. We need, we need to be able to spend time cultivating the student's ability to express what they feel, what they think, and how all what their experiences are, how all of this affects the way they use their body, because every experience you have is in your body and affects how you, how you play. I was, as I was thinking about answering this question, you know, thinking about how we're trained. I mean, I'm a violinist, so I grew up playing in orchestras. And actually, I think, um, Brandon, I really love what you said, not having a clear definition of success. Because in orchestra, say, which was my experience, we always know where we are in the ranking and the definition of success is first chair, right? So we are constantly striving for that or we always know where we aren't. and. Of course, like competition can be a healthy thing, but it also, I think if we're not talking about what other definitions of success can be, it's kind of, we're all assuming the same one, right? We're all assuming that the higher level, the harder, maybe the harder you work, right? The harder you push will make you more successful. And I think that can really start the patterns essentially of that can lead to burnout, you know, when you're, mm. if you're attached to your to-do list and your productivity and all of that. So I think it's also rewiring music education or how we're, what conversations we're adding to the picture, I think, because I don't think that that training is necessarily bad. I think it's bad if there's conversations that aren't happening around it to talk about, well, what is success? What is success for you? May not be what that other person wants for success and give people permission to to create their own definition of success, because I think there's just a narrow, narrow understanding of what success is. And that creates this sort of endless striving for things that we may think we want. And that's probably also another conversation, but. <laughs> sure. Yeah, and the striving for things that we think we want, but we actually don't want. And that yeah. creates a whole another thing. So what you were saying that there's a narrow definition of success and we really find this in the classical world. I'm a flute player. And what we're taught is, well, you've got to play in an orchestra or you've got to teach or else you're not legit musician. <laughs> well, who says? Like, come on. <laughs> you know, well, you must not be very good if you only teach. Excuse me. Maybe that's maybe that's my passion. OK, I do fitness. Does that mean I'm not a legit musician? Absolutely not. But we're like, oh, well, you didn't go down these two paths, you know. So so taking a step back and realizing that we're all made different. We all have different passions, right? really fostering that and nurturing that in your students, in, in your colleagues, in your kids, whoever, you know, in yourself and realizing that there is validity, there is worth and there is, there's total value in whatever passion you have and whatever direction that takes in music. Not everybody's supposed to be in the orchestra. I have zero desire to play full-time in orchestra. I play part-time, it's perfect. Would I love studio work? Sure, <laughs> I like to sight read. I don't want to be a soloist and work on rep and that's not my jam. I'm sorry. Nope. The shorter the deadline, the better. But, you know, there's there's all these different avenues that we can explore. And I think that's not really 
talked a lot about, at least in the higher education, I know I didn't get a whole lot of that. And then going back even earlier, there wasn't an emphasis on the body like Lee was talking about. It was the end result. You have to get this sound. We want it to sound this way. Your fingers should move like this. But how do you feel? And you know, it wasn't until I got to my master's degree and my professor said, well, do you feel your feet when you play? What? My, my feet? What do you mean my feet? You know? And it's this whole thing of, well, you're wrapped up here. And that's another reason why we, you know, I find that we get injured is that we're not paying attention to ourselves. And that can manifest in burnout because that's an emotional thing we're not allowing ourselves to feel either because the music came first and somebody else's idea came first and at the expense of us. So it comes down to nurturing that in yourself. What do you really want? It's okay to want what you want. And a lot of times we're not taught that it's okay to want what we want. We can only want what we need. And wow. that need can come from someone else instead of us.